I must say I'm a little bit cynical after the many years of doing this that so far core materials have been incrementally improved. We, we haven't seen a big jump in improvement. And after 100 years of magnetic materials, I'm not sure we're going to see it. I hope I'm wrong. I'd like to see it. But uh, let, let, let's see what happens next. Despite this, power supplies have not really been held back by the size of the magnetics. But we have to change our circuit design paradigms and entrenched rules of thumb if we want to see progress in power supply design. And it may not be the magnetics materials that people are talking about with a lack of progress. It may be they want the high density, but they also want it at very low price, which is always, of course, the uh, difficulty in doing power supply design. Let's talk a little bit about design structure. This is a very simplistic approach here. But uh, I, I always uh, question the people in our course, when you're designing a buck converter, let's say for a point of load, how much ripple should you have in your inductor when you're doing the design? And here's a starting design where it's got, well, maybe 30% of ripple in the inductor. And that 30% refers to how much peak-to-peak -peak current is there relative to DC. And I ask people in the class, I say, well, what should the ripple be? And everybody scratches their heads a little bit, and somebody will raise his hand and say 5%. Another one will say 10%. Another one will say 30%. One time we had Intel people in our course, and they uh, designed an inductor with 200% ripple in it. Because the thing that Intel really, really cares about is transient response and how fast they can slew the inductor current. But here's a rule of thumb that will appear in textbooks, will appear in magnetics design, that you should have a certain amount of ripple. And we can question these rules of thumb. If we go with 30%, we've got 173 microjoules stored in the inductor at the peak, 20 amps DC current, and 1.8 amps of AC current. But we don't have to stay there. We can change this inductor, put more ripple current in here. Now we've got 66% of ripple current. We've got 106 microjoules, which is a drop down. And we've got more AC current flowing and, of course, the same amount of DC. But the inductor value has now dropped down to 300 nanohenries, and before we had 600 nanohenries. The second curve, the bottom curve here, shows much more ripple current in the inductor. Now the ripple is going to 125%. Energy stored in the inductor, the needed energy, is, is much lower. DC current is still high. AC current has climbed to 7.23 amps, but we've dropped the inductor value down from 0.6 microhenries down to 160 nanohenries. Don't have to stop. We can go a little crazy and go all the way to discontinuous mode if we want to on a buck converter. Never would have done this uh, 20 years ago in design. This would be crazy because you're beating up silicon too hard for a 40 amp uh, uh, switch. We're now running sorry, a 20 amp uh, output, we're now running 40 amps through the switch. But silicon has come a long, long way. It's cheap, it's very low on resistance, it works very well. So we have the option now of shifting the stress out from the inductor, take the inductor down now to 100 nanohenries, and uh, we've got lots of ripple current. It's 11.6 amps RMS ripple current compared to 20 amps DC. But we shifted all the way to discontinuous mode. Why would we want to do that? Well, something magic happens here. When you go discontinuous mode, you can now run the circuit as zero voltage switching. And people have long known this. They do this with their flyback converters where they run boundary conduction and get uh, basically the, the switch that's going to turn on next has no voltage across it when you turn it on. So you eliminate all switching losses. Vicor has taken advantage of this in some of their um, converters, not the only ones to do so. But they have a zero voltage switch bug regulator, which is basically DCM, lots of ripple in the inductor. The size is very, very small. And the little picture here shows approximately a 200 watt converter. And uh, how small is small enough? I think we start getting into the question is not, can we make it small, but can we make it small and very cheap at the same time? But it's not the magnetics holding the design back here. It's just the investment in some more technology.
and stress is shifting over to the switches and the caps away from the inductor. These things have been happening in the industry, and as it's been going along, the magnetics vendors have, have responded, always a little bit later than needed, but they have responded. So we've had three generation of off-the-shelf cores for magnetics vendors. Many of them make this kind of uh, core that you can just pick up and buy. Generation one was lots and lots of thin wire sitting inside a drum core, um, many, many layers in there. And these are very, very cheap to make. They're still around, but they're very, very poor AC inductors because you've got lots and lots of turns layers. It violates everything you should do with proximity loss. And they sit right inside the gap of the inductor right here. Let me try and highlight it for you. So all these turns are sitting inside the gap, and they're getting very, very hot. Second generation of off-the-shelf inductors changed that. They said, okay, let's put the gap somewhere proper away from the windings and then move the windings out of the gap. But you've still got lots and lots of layers in here in this inductor. And uh, if you've been through proximity loss, you know that's not a good thing to do. Third generation switched over to helical windings of foil. Now we're down to the equivalent, just one layer of winding because we've changed the rotation of the winding. So it's a very good AC inductor. It's also a very good DC inductor. So this is generation three that every vendor is making now with these flat windings. They found out how to do that cost effectively. There's a limit to how far you can take this. If you squish it flatter and flatter, these windings are going to talk to each other through capacitive, and the resonant frequency of these inductors is not going to be as high as you want it. So what we're looking for is a generation four now that can hire, ver handle very high ripple currents uh, we may even get rid of the DC currents, and that's what people are struggling to deal with if they're working with LLC converters or some of the other converters that work in high ripple. Let's look at another quick design here. It's not just buck converters that do this. This is a full bridge converter. And uh, I did something interesting from my own point of view here. Is I went back in design time to about 30 years ago for my first ever full bridge converter and looked at the design and saw, well, how, how would this be built today? Because it's much bigger than a modern one kilowatt converter. But everything was done back then in one stage. You worked from a wide range input right here, and you designed the converter for that full range. That meant your transformer turns ratio was about 15 to 1 because you had to deal with low line. And here we used low ripple in the inductor in those days, about 6% ripple compared to DC. And we did that because we didn't have very good output capacitors. Things have changed since these days. So the trend of the industry is one, of course, put some multi-layer ceramics on there, which don't have any ESR, start bumping up the ripple current in the inductor, just like we did for the buck converter. Now we take a 4.2 microhenry inductor and it's dropped to a 600 nanohenry inductor. Big change. We restrict the input to the converter. We'll see how we do that in a moment. And then suddenly that lets us go to a 30 to 1 transformer instead of a 15 to 1. Next step in design, you say, okay, let's regulate the input. I have high ripple current in the inductor, regulate the input. So now, now we don't have to worry about any range. Our inductor drops down to 0.4 microhenries. The transformer climbs to 45 to 1. Much less stress going into that transformer and on the semiconductors. Then finally, we go to this step at the end here, which is multi-layer ceramic caps. And now we're non-regulated with fixed duty cycle. And we can drop our 40, uh, sorry, 0 0.4 microhenries down to about 60 nanohenries. And our transformer goes to a 58 to 1. And then the last step is we go to a 98% duty cycle converter, and we throw the inductor away. We run just off ripple current uh, off the leakage inductance in the transformer. So here we've achieved the magic. We didn't have to go to multi megahertz to do that. The inductor is gone. But of course we've lost regulation. But this is this is a trend in the industry. You do it in two steps. You regulate, then you isolate, and the overall size is going to be smaller. Not just the inductors gone here, the transformer turn ratio is now 60 to 1, 
and what was an 8 amp primary current is now down to 2 amps primary current. So the stress on the transformer is much slower, the transformer is going to get much smaller. Secondary voltage stress has gone down to 12 volts on the rectifiers, used to be 50 volts with the original design. So this is the trend in the industry to shrink the inductors, change the function of the power stage, and then the magnetics no longer become the obstacle in the converter. Got to add another power stage, but that one can use the same tricks and can also shrink the inductors and transformers this way. LLC converter, everybody's favorite these days. What did the LLC converter do? Well, almost the same thing as the full bridge converter. The output inductor is gone right here. You don't see it, but we go straight from the diodes into the cap. It's moved into the primary, but in the primary, it's a much, much smaller value, and it's resonating with the capacitor over there. But if, if you like, this is a little bit analogous to what they're doing in the buck converter. This uh, inductor is now seeing plus or minus a very high flux swing. It's a pure AC inductor. None of the off-the-shelf inductors that I've seen so far are going to handle this very well. So people are deciding, should I use the internal leakage of the transformer, which also is not a very good inductor, or should we come up with some new strategy for this resonant inductor in the circuit? But you can see the trend here is the same, shrinking the inductor down to get rid of it, not being achieved through better core materials from the magnetics vendors. Okay, here I go out on a limb with my forecast, which is probably wrong. But, uh, of course, the, the, the industry, as always, will bifurcate in many different directions. Some people would design this way. Some people would design other ways. But high ripple current inductor designs are coming in very strongly. The LLC is, is, is a big part of this, and that's a high ripple current design. Discontinuous mode is coming into play again. So zero voltage switching can be much more important than shrinking down the ripple in the inductor because it makes the semiconductors run so cool. For me, high frequency means converters up to 5 megahertz. I haven't seen any compelling reason at this point to go beyond that. And um, I'm sure later in the year that some of the university research will explain some of the things they're doing to push to 20, 50, 100 megahertz and what is achieved there. Core material improvements, I don't think they're going to be a big breakthrough there. It's going to be incremental. And I don't know if a breakthrough is there to be had and whether it's just a case of insufficient funding or whether it just cannot be done. And uh, maybe some magnetics people can answer that a little better than I can. Um, I used to go visit core vendors a long time ago and... Uh, they used to have little research departments where they'd have an electron microscope, look at green structures, and a couple of scientists there who were trying to develop new materials. I don't know if that's still happening. And I don't, certainly not happening with the amount of funding that should be going into it if there is some breakthrough waiting for us. Data standardization is a big one for me. I, I think it's badly needed from the core manufacturers to ease confusion. And I'd like to see the raw data on the core loss, and I brought this up the other day with uh, the group of PSMA, and somebody said, well, they probably don't have it anymore for many of the curves. I don't know if that's true. And I'm not really sure why we've never had this before, but it sure would be nice to get that. Creative core loss ge core geometries I needed, I think. That gets us into uh, proximity loss and the windings a little bit beyond the scope of what I'm talking about here, but we're going to need some different geometries. This flat helical inductor is not going to endure as the, um, as the frequencies go up. It's going to get too flat, and we're going to have to go to a different structure, I think. Magnetic core will not go away, however much as is wished for. Again, we're all waiting, I think, for Fin6 to come out with their product and see whether they achieve that promise, and we're all happy to be surprised. It happened several times in this industry. This one here is a little strange, that uh, point of load applications. They've happily switched over to multi-phase bucks. And we're now multi-phase bucking from 12 volts down to 1. It's not very efficient. And uh, we've seen the first uh, application, I think, of a transformer coming into play and the point of load converters 
which is going to horrify people because now we're going to add more magnetics to the circuit. But I think that's in inevitable. And then the multi-converter processing will continue to proliferate where we have specific power stages for specific parts, some for regulation, some for just isolation. I can see my time is up here. I'm uh, sorry I had to go so quickly. And we'll